On our project is one of several around the world concerned with deep seismic reflection profiling of the continents. The aim was to image the structure of the upper lithosphere beneath Finland. So FIRE stands for the Finland Reflection Experiment. And the images were acquired between 2001 and 2005. So what was the target? Well, Finland sits in the Fellerskandian Shield, or Baltic Shield, and straddles the edge of the Archean Age Karelian Craton. Plastered onto the southwest side of the Karelian Craton are the so-called Svecofenian Island Arc Rocks, and these constitute an old Proterozoic mobile belt. So what's the deep structure of this mobile belt? Well, that was something the FIRE project wanted to establish. The area is also important because the Fenoscandian Shield is amongst the very thickest continental crust outside areas that are today seeing crustal shortening. So what's the structure of this very thick continental crust, some 55 to 60 kilometres thick? So the FIRE project is one of a series of seismic experiments that run across this part of the world. FIRE is associated with deep reflection profiling, and one of the FIRE profiles, FIRE 1, more or less follows the line of an old wide-angle experiment, the Sveka 81 profile. We're going to look at the FIRE 1 and Sveka 81 data. So, the FIRE deep reflection profiles were acquired by Vibrasize, and in order to get enough signal in here, they used five 15.4 tonne vibrator trucks, and the seismometers provided a record down to 30 seconds two-way time. So let's have a look at the profile. Now it's a very long profile, so it's split into two parts. So this is the northeastern part coming off the craton. And the craton's over there on the right. Let's look at the scale. That's 50 kilometer scale bar there horizontally. And the profile's displayed more or less at one to one, and it's depth migrated, and we're looking down to a depth of 80 kilometers. So the Archean craton's over there on the right, and it's weakly deformed presumably by the same collision events which accreted the arc terrains. And the island arc terrains are most of this image here, particularly towards the left. So this is strongly deformed Paleoproterozoic island arc rocks. OK, now in order to see what's going on at depth, we're going to go off and look at the uh, wide angle experiment, the Sveka 1 line, so we can make a comparison. So the profile's displayed in depth, and there's significant vertical exaggeration on this display. And these are the results. With the numbers in there showing seismic velocities, the thick black lines are wide angle reflections denoting interfaces with marked differences in seismic velocity. It's quite a complicated diagram, so let's simplify it a bit, add some colour. So we've got various domains in here. Essentially, it's a four layer model as simplified with seismic velocities ranging near the surface there of 6.05 kilometers per second, right up and exceeding eight kilometers a second in the presumed mantle rocks at the bottom of the profile. So how do these seismic velocity zones relate to the rocks, in other words, the real geology? Well, first of all, let's just summarize the variations with seismic velocity with depth seen in this profile. So here's a compilation made by Cusisto et al, showing depth plotted against seismic velocity. And we're going to look at various velocity depth profiles, and here they are. So we can see, as you move to greater depth, overall, the seismic velocity increases. There's no surprise there. And it also increases in each one of those clusters. As you increase in depth, the seismic velocity goes up. So what do these various domains represent in terms of rocks? Well, we can measure the seismic velocity of rocks in the laboratory, and we can scale the measurements we make in the laboratory to the conditions we find in the crust at particular temperatures and pressures. But how do we know what the various rocks are? Well, of course, we can collect them at the Earth's surface, so we can characterize the range of geology in the upper crust, but we can also use xenoliths that have been brought up from depth in younger volcanic rocks. So we know what the various components are 
that need to go into our different layers. The question is, how do we combine these different components to make the rocks in the layers themselves? In other words, how do we design a recipe? Well, that's what Casisto et al. set about doing. So we know the ingredients, and we know what the result of our recipes need to be in terms of a range of seismic velocities. So let's look at each of these domains in turn. And this little package in here we can make by having a combination of metasediments and granites and granite gneiss in the proportions shown by that pie chart on the left. And we can do this in turn from layer to layer as we go across the graph. So in this one in here we can make that range of seismic velocities by having a large component of granites and granite gneiss again and we'll combine that with a small slice of maker igneous rocks and their metamorphosed equivalents, amphibolites. In the next domain in here, there's rather less granite and granite gneiss, rather more mafix and amphibolites, and little slice of metasediments. In this domain in here, we've changed. So we've only got a little bit of granite and granite gneiss, but half of this material in here is made up of mafix and their metamorphic equivalent, the amphibolites, together with a large swathe of tonalites. Let's keep going. In this domain in here, which is getting quite deep in the crust, you'll see that we're between about 25 and 40 kilometers down. Well, we can get the velocities that are recorded for this domain by having about one third mafic granulites, one third mafic amphibolites, and one third tonalites. Now let's move deep to the lower part of the crust down in here. And now these higher velocity rocks, which have got an average velocity there of what, about 7.4 kilometers per second. Well, to get those sorts of velocities, we need to say that this crustal volume comprises largely mafic granulites, together with some less metamorphosed mafic amphibolites and some mafic echolites, so high pressure rocks. And finally, of course, we cross into the mantle down in here, where the seismic velocities go above 8, and that can be explained simply by having a whole pile of peridotites. So this is how we can combine different rock types and their seismic velocity to model the measured seismic velocities for different levels in our profiles. The composition, in other words the recipes, vary with depth, but overall the seismic velocity also increases with depth. So let's go back to our profiles. Here's this Fecca 81 wide angle profile with the seismic velocities and our layered structure. And what we're saying is the bottom of it consists of mantle, and so it's 100% peridotite. The lowest crustal levels in here with seismic velocities of 7.33 to 7.38 are mafic granulites and eclogites. The middle crustal layer also largely comprises mafic rocks, but these are at lower grade and are at um, up to amphibolite flashes, together with some tonalites. And the upper crust is largely made up of granites, granite gneiss, and metasediments. And collectively, this is our layered structure. So now let's try and tie it to the seismic reflection data of the Fire 1 profile. Let's now pick out these two depths, which bracket the lower crustal layer comprising mafic granulites and echogites. The lower boundary of this represents the moho, in other words, the base of the crust. Let's mix this into the seismic reflection profile. There we go. So we're saying that those two arrows pick the top and base of our lower crustal layer of mafic rocks. You notice that the moho level is pretty indistinct, and the top of this mafic lower crustal layer is where the reflectivity really begins to kick on up. So this is our northeast segment of the fire profile. Let's go and have a look and see how this compares on into the southern part of the fire one profile where we're dealing exclusively with these strongly deformed Paleoproterozoic island art rocks. Here we go. And this reflective top of the mafic lower crust is particularly evident in this southern part of the fire one profile. There's a vague hint of the moho at 60 kilometers or so down. It's a very weak reflector. It's pretty indistinct. 
In contrast, the top of the lower crustal layer, at around 40 kilometers, represents the edge of a reflective zone coming through, and it's overlain by mafic rocks and tonalites. The upper crust is very highly structured, with a lot of really quite complicated reflector patterns in there. So we have a very structured upper crust, and this comprises granites, granite nights, and metasediments. So there's a change in the seismic reflection character associated with these layers that we picked out in the wide angle velocity experiment. So, a layered continental crust. The lower crust and the upper mantle have not radically different seismic velocities, and so perhaps that is why the moho here is pretty indistinct in the Fire 1 profile. So by integrating wide-angle refraction lines with deep seismic reflection profiles, like the Fire line, and tying this into known rock compositions that were calibrated by xenoliths and outcrop geology, we could begin to get an idea of what the deep structure and the deep geology of this shield area, of this part of the continental crust. And the question is, is this representative of shield areas elsewhere in the world? You can see these images and some of the interpretations on the Virtual Seismic Atlas.